Heavenly Father, I ask for wisdom and guidance. Help me that I may know you more and live my life the way you want it to be lived. I want to be a part of something greater than myself. I want to help accomplish your mission for the church, to be the hands and feet of Christ here on earth. Lord, I pray that you will help me embrace your purpose for my life, my family, my job, my school, and my church. Let me be a part of a generation that seeks your face, that knows your name, that puts you at the center of our lives. Help me encourage my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that we may build each other up in your word. I can see the great work you're doing in my life and the lives for those around me. Let us fulfill your great commission, doing kingdom work throughout our daily lives. I want to run the race well, living out your call on my life, and make my life count. I want to thank you for allowing Kathy and I to get away and spend a few weeks uh, just being together and um, sleeping. I've done a lot of sleeping over the last few weeks and just playing and having a good time and thank you for giving us the privilege to do that and for giving us a home to come back to. So I want to thank you very much for all of that. Now I'm going to ask you if you would join me in prayer right now. Father, we come to you today and Father, we lift up the families in El Paso those families who've lost a loved one in the shooting that took place yesterday, 20 some odd, and those others who have a family member that has been shot but still alive. God, I pray that you would be with these families and these that are injured and you would restore Father, I pray for those in Dayton, Ohio, that a few hours later experienced more killing. And God, I pray that you would be with these churches that are ministering to these families and these communities, that they would be the arms and feet of Jesus among them and that they would help in the restoration. Father, move and help our country. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, as uh, we were gone, our former senior pastor, uh, Fent Moorhead and Mary were back with us, and wasn't it great to have them back in our church? And Pastor Fenton is an amazing preacher and teacher. We're so, I'm so, so proud of them. The Moorheads will forever be a vital part, a special part of Sugar Creek Baptist Church. You might have noticed number one. You can't miss it. It's eight feet tall and one and a half feet wide. You couldn't miss it. So what does this number one mean? Well, it could mean that you are number one. All of us want to be number one about something, right? So maybe that's it. Or it could be talking about the trades that the Houston Astros made this last week, which were pretty amazing. I'm telling you, pretty shocking, pretty amazing. And now the truth is there's no doubt that they are the number one baseball team on the planet, at least at least on paper. Now they got to win it all now, but I think they will. I think they're going to win, win the World Series. Or it could mean that football season is only a few weeks away. And we, that means college football is almost here. And it means that by the time that the college football season is over, there is going to be a number one team. And so which team do you think will end up number one? I agree with you, OU Sooners. 
Thank you so much. I think you're exactly right about that. Actually, this number one doesn't mean any of those things. This number one actually means you and I have one life to live. Only one. In this flesh, we've got one life to live, and that's all. Now, here is the truth. Every Christian, every Christian lives forever. No Christian ever dies. And this was Jesus' promise. He said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die die. Now, how do I know that that is absolutely true? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And his resurrection proved that everything he said is true. Our bodies do die. But who we are, our soul, our spirit, the very moment our body dies, our soul and spirit comes up out of this body and goes immediately into the presence of God himself. And we never die. But you and I in this flesh have only one life to live. We better not mess this up. If you wreck your car, you can go out and get another car. You lose your job, you can go get another job. If your sports team does not win, there is always next year. But you and I only have one life, and we only have one shot, and we better do it right. We had better make the most of our life, and that is what I want to talk to you about today and over the next few weeks. We had better make the most of our life. Did you know the Bible even says that our life does not last very long? Listen to what James says in James chapter 4, verse 14. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And truly, the older we get, the more we feel that very way. It just isn't lasting very long. We better make the most of it. It's a true story about the missionary, the story I'm going to tell you about this missionary. It was about, what, 1902, 1903, and this missionary had lived almost his, all his adult life in Africa as a missionary in Africa, sharing Christ with others. He led so many people to the Lord and discipled so many people, and he lived almost all of his adult life in Africa as a missionary, but he is now old in 1902, 1903 now old, and he is coming back to the United States. And in 1902 and 3, the only way you can come back from Africa to the United States is by ship. So he's on a ship, and he is headed back for the U.S. And when you know, it would be the same ship that the president of the United States is also on, Teddy Roosevelt. And Roosevelt has been in Africa in, on a safari, big game hunting, two weeks, and now he is headed back to the U.S. on the same ship as the missionary. And when it rolls in to New York City, there on the shore are bands and thousands of people greeting the president in his return. And when it stops and the gangplank comes down, comes down Teddy Roosevelt, and they, the bands are playing and the people are cheering and they're applauding him and it was just incredible and wonderful. And then he and his entourage keeps right on moving. And then it becomes time now for, as all the other passengers are leaving, for this missionary to come. And the missionary is coming down the gangplank and there is nobody to meet him. Nobody. And it, he sees all of this and it hurts his feelings. And he says, he complains to God, and he says to God, it's not fair. The president goes over to Africa for two weeks to shoot at other animals and then comes back and there's bands playing and there's people applauding and clapping. And I've given my whole life to seeing people come to faith in Christ, and here I am, and there's not one person to meet me. It is, I am now home, and there is nobody here for me. And a few moments later, he heard in his heart, God replied to him and say, God said, yes, but you're not home yet. Now, 
None of us are. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Yes, but you're not home yet. I'll promise you this, when we get home, there'll be bands playing and angels singing and people gathering to welcome us home, and I really actually don't know about the bands playing. But I do know, I do know angels singing, and I do know a reception is waiting, but greater than all of that, you will see Jesus Christ. You will see Jesus, and you will be in the presence of God when we get home. But between now and then, we've got to have our life count. We've got to make our life count. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The truth is, your life can matter for something bigger than you. Mine can too. And one of the ways that God uses for our lives to matter for something bigger than us, he uses this church as a conduit to be able to use us in a way that is bigger than us. And this church is a conduit that God uses for God to use us in a great and powerful way. Today I want to talk to you about embracing God's purpose for your life. And the truth is, I believe there's at least four goals that God wants you and I to accomplish with our life. I'm not saying these are the only ones, but I'm saying there's at least four that God wants you and I to accomplish in our life. So why am I here? What is this whole life about? I can tell you at least four things. The first is God wants you to know Him. God put you on this planet so that you would come to know Him. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3. He says, and this is eternal life, that they might know you. Speaking about His heavenly Father, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. One of the great goals of why God brings us onto this planet is that we might know Him. And listen to what Paul says about this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. God wants a personal relationship with you. I mean this. He wants a personal relationship with you, and you can have this personal relationship with God. So how do you have this personal relationship with God? Well, it begins by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. It begins by receiving the only way that God has given to us to know Him, and that is through His Son. It begins by making that decision, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart by faith. I give my life to Him. But that's just the beginning. It's not the end. How we then grow the relationship with God, I believe it's this way. I have learned in my life how to practice the presence of God in my life. When I'm praying, when I am praying, I practice the reality. God is with me wherever I go. The same with you. He is right there beside me, and I'm just talking to him. When I am praying, I'm just talking to God. It is a conversation. It's what prayer was meant to be. And when I am reading God's Word or I'm listening to God's Word, I imagine God is right beside me and He is the one that is speaking these words to me. I have learned as I have practiced the presence of Christ in my life. While I'm praying, while I am reading or hearing God's Word, there is such a sense of the presence of God. There is like, God is right beside me. He hears my prayers. It is a conversation with Him. I am hearing Him speak back to me. And to be, to be honest with you, there is this sense, it seems wherever I go, He's in my car. He is in the store with me. He is wherever I am. And when I have learned how to practice the presence of Christ in my life, the most amazing relationship has emerged. 
you can have a relationship with God. It begins by receiving Christ and then by growing in your prayer with Him, in your talking to Him, and you hearing Him talk to you and living life together. I think about Enoch in the book of, of Genesis and an Enoch walk with God. I think that's the whole idea of walking with God. Every day, the sense of God right here beside me, here we go. You can know God. It is God's great goal for your life. But there's a second goal in this life that he has. God wants us to experience life as he created it to be. Listen to how Jesus puts it in John chapter 10 verse 10. My purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. Jesus is saying, I created life and I want you to experience all the life that I created for you. All of the joy, all of the laughter, all of the fun, all of the excitement of life, all of the purpose and meaning of life. I want you to know it all. And all of the while that you are experiencing this, that you have responsibility and honor of life and obedience to God, I want you to experience life in all of its fullness. So, I'm so grateful that God gave me the dad that he gave me, and the mom that he gave me, and my two sisters that he gave me. I'm so grateful that God gave my wife Kathy to me to be my life partner. And the years that we have spent together sharing life together, and the strength that she has been in my life. I'm so grateful for my two sons that God gave to us to be able to walk through every phase of life with these two boys and to see them grow up to be men and to be men of character and love the Lord and to walk with Him. I am so excited about what I experienced and am experiencing with them. I am so proud of my grandkids. I got four grandkids. It is so much fun to live life with them and experience their personality he's coming out. Two have already come to know Christ as Savior, and it's just so much fun to watch these four kids grow up. I'm so proud of Sugar Creek Baptist Church, and I want to tell you, I love you, and I'm so grateful I get the privilege to be a part of this church. I'm so happy about baseball I love baseball. I loved playing baseball. I love watching baseball. I love everything about baseball except losing baseball. I hate losing baseball, but I love everything else about baseball. I love football. Don't love it as much as baseball, but I love football. I love it when OU beats Texas. I love it. Now, all you Texas, I fans, you love beating OU, and you know that. And you are having a high day when that happens too. I love my car. I've loved every car I've ever had. I've only bought cars that I really loved. And I have always built this bond with my car. I know how dumb this sounds. I know it. And I know how materialistic it comes across. But I will tell you this. All my life, my car was more than a car. There was this bond between my car and me, and it's just my personality. Why am I saying all this ridiculous stuff? Because it's life. God says, I I want you to live. I don't want you just to clock in. I want you to live. I want you to live the moments. I want you to experience the moments. I want you to be aware of your life. And I want you to enjoy life and live it in all of its fullness. And by the way, some of the fullness is pain and hurt and heartache and disappointment and sometimes sense of despair. All of it is life. It's his real life. And Jesus said, I want you to live life in all of its fullness. And don't get cheated by any of it. And all the while that you're living life, live it with responsibility, live it with honor, 
Live it with obedience to God. Live life. The second purpose that he gives to us is to live life. Don't just clock in and clock out. Live it. The third purpose that he gives to us is that God wants us to accomplish a mission for him. Listen to what Jesus said. Now, Jesus is talking to his heavenly Father, and in John chapter 17, verse 4, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Can you say that? Can you say that? I have brought you honor on the earth by completing the mission that you gave me to do. I don't know what your mission is. I don't know what God's plan for you is, but I do know He has gifted you and empowered you to accomplish it. And I know that part of that mission has to do with your family. And I know that part of that mission has to do with your talents and your spiritual gifts and your experiences in life and your personality, all the ways in which you're wired. God has taken all the ways in which He has wired you and all of it somehow is a part of your mission. And connected to all of that, one of the great parts of our mission is accomplishing God's mission on the earth. And Jesus told us what it's called the Great Commission. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 28? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. I'm with you always. I'm with you wherever you are. I'm with you when you're hurting. I'm with you when you're laughing. I'm with you in whatever you're experiencing. I'm with you when you are in such pain and heartache. I'm with you when you're in cancer. I'm with you when you are in heart problems. I am with you anytime, any place, at all times. Lo, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying. It's not enough that you're a part of a church that is on mission and is seeing all these great things, the Great Commission happening. I mean, I'm thanking God that I'm a part of a church that is deeply dived in to the Great Commission. I am very grateful for that. But it's not enough just to be a member of a church, sit back in my seat on Sunday morning. You know, I'm really proud of my church going out there on mission. Because God intended the Great Commission not to be something, a command that He just gives to the whole church collectively, but He has given it to each one of us individually. This is your commission. It is. This is your commission. God's called you to the Great Commission. It's not enough to just to come, okay, well, I'll give some money. Well, that's great, but that's not enough because actually one of the purposes that God has given you for your life is for you to be on mission with Him and to accomplish this Great Commission yourself. So what does that mean? How does that play out? Well, one of the ways it plays out is that I'm telling other people about Jesus. I'm sharing Christ with other people. Oh, no. Mm -mm. No -uh. See, I couldn't even do that. I wouldn't know what to say. I don't know the words that I would speak. It wouldn't make any sense. I cannot explain it. No, I can't do that. Oh, you could. We have gospel conversation training in which it is so simple, it's unbelievable. You look at it and say, good grief, are you serious? It's that easy? I can put all these thoughts together so easily. This I cannot believe it. We have trained almost now almost 1,700 people. And if you haven't been trained, come and get trained. 
There, there's going to be a training time in your worship guide or coming in your worship guide in the next few weeks. Learn how, very simply, how to share your faith with somebody else because you know people that do not know Jesus as Savior, and God's called you. It's not just the church on mission. It's you and me. He has called us. One of the purposes that God has given us individually is to share Jesus with somebody else, is to be on mission. There's a second part of being on mission, just inviting people to church. We can do that. Did you know that so many people invite people to church at Sugar Creek? It's amazing. I'm just, I'm blown away by it. At the number of people in this church that invite people to church to come to Sugar Creek. I'm amazed by it. And did you know that in every service that we have, in this service, every service that we have, we have people that are here that were invited by somebody else, and they're right here, right now in the pew listening to me. Now, we just completed these um, communication cards, these pesky communication cards. Do you know what I'm talking about? And Bruce, the card guy, came up. Okay, and I need everybody to fill out this card. Do you know why we do the cards? Because we have people all over this worship center, and you don't know who they are, but people that are visiting for the first or second or third or fourth time, we have people in these pews right now who are visiting in this service who are been invited to come to church, and here they are. And this card is our link to these people that are visiting our church. And you know, it's amazing what happens. First time they come, we give them a gift that is a gift you'd want to actually have. We give them a gift, and we, we actually reach out to them. And then the next time they come, we connect back with them. And the third time they come, we connect back with them. And the most amazing thing happens. Many of the people that are visiting our church our service, in this service right now, don't know Jesus Christ yet. And here they are, and you've invited them. And others know Christ, but they don't have a church home, and maybe this will become their church home. It is amazing how many hundreds you'd be shocked. I don't know what the number is right now. I don't want to give you a number that's not going to be accurate, but it's in the thousands of people that visit our church. It's amazing. And you know why they visit? you invite them. You're doing it. You're doing mission. Now look, you know when Pastor Bruce comes up here and says, now I need everybody to fill out the card. And we're sitting there and we're saying, I've been a member of this church for like a million years and I don't think you need me to fill out a card. Why am I having to fill out one of these cards? It's for people that are visiting, not me. Do you know why he does this? Here's why. Because it's been proven. I mean, there are, all, there are studies about everything, and there's a study about this. Here is what's been proven, that if a person is visiting the church and someone says, would you fill out this card, they look around to see if there's anybody else filling out this card. And if nobody else is filling out the card, they don't fill it out. But if they fill out the card, but if they see other people filling out the card, they fill theirs out too because everybody's filling it out. How hard is this? All you have to do as a member of this church is put your name on there. Does it take five seconds? And it's part of mission because what you're doing is, is that you're kind of freeing up other people. Nobody else is looking at me. Actually, they are. And you don't know. And so when we fill it out, others fill it out, and when they fill it out, it becomes our link to them. And it is amazing how many people that fill out cards end up becoming a part of this church. Come to know Christ as Savior, end up joining our church. It's unbelievable. Here's what I, the point I'm making. We're on mission. And it's not just the church, it's us individually. In so many little ways and big ways, God has called us to the mission of the great commission of Jesus Christ. There is a fourth purpose that God has given to us. God wants to prepare us for heaven. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And this was his purpose, that when the time is right, he will gather us together to be with him in Christ 
forever. He is saying that all of history is moving to a particular destiny. And guess what? Your life and my life is moving to a destiny too. And every day we wake up is one day closer to heaven every, for every single one of us. We are moving to a destiny. And in this destiny that we're moving to, God brings both fun things and hurtful things, both pleasurable things and challenging things. It is life. It is real life. It is real life. And all of these things that we go through, all God is using to get us ready for heaven. And if we'll see every one of them in that way, it changes everything. Life is preparation for eternity. You were made to live with, forever with God. It's not a slam dunk you will. you got to receive Christ as Savior. But once you receive Christ as Savior, you're going to live with God forever. And God is getting you ready in the good things, the fun things, in the not-so-good things, not-so-fun things, in all these things, they are being used by God to prepare you for heaven. Four goals. Knowing God, experiencing life, not just living it, not just clocking in and out, experiencing life and accomplishing God's mission and being a part of that and getting ready for heaven. So between now and heaven, there is a race to run. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way that you get the prize. This was so important to Paul that he says in the book of Acts, I consider my life worth nothing. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that Jesus has given me. This is the definition of being sold out to Christ. This is the definition of it. I consider my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race and complete the task that Jesus has given me. Let me ask you a question. Listen, life is not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. How many of you have been marathon runners? Would you raise your hand right now? Marathon runners. Okay. Counting one, two, three, four. I'm telling you, Sugar Creek is not into marathons. There were four people in the last service. There were zero in the first service. And I counted four hands in this service, something. How many of you have ever heard of the marathon before? You've ever heard of it? Okay, we've heard about it at least, right? So what happens in a marathon? We, you, 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 there's, just, there's like hundreds of people stacked up, right? They're all stacked up. Takes, it seems like forever to finally get everybody out running. But how many people finish it? There's not hundreds. There's a whole bunch of them about halfway through. This is why you don't do it, isn't it? You're going to go like one-tenth of a mile and say, okay, I'm done now. But, or, but there, okay, some, some halfway through, some two-thirds of the way through, some three-quarters of the way. But there are some who finish the marathon. They ran the whole thing. See, anybody can start it but only some can end it. And what God is actually saying to us is, I want you to run well, and I want you to finish well. I want you to go to all the way to the finish line in this life I gave you. Now the question is, how do we make it to the finish line? How do we run well all the way to the end? Well, there's four questions we've got to ask and answer. And the first question is this, what will be the center of your life? What will be the core of your life? What will be the hub of your life? I want you to see this wagon wheel for a moment. I want you to look at it. This is the idea right here. You see it? What will be 
the core, the, the hub of your life. It's right there in the middle. And notice that all the spokes are connected to the hub. Each one of these spokes are about some aspect of your life. It's family or time or job or school or something are all the spokes of our life, and they're all connected to the hub. And then there is the outer realm. So what is it in your life that holds everything together? What is, what is the core of your life? Can I tell you that for some in this room, I mean, I don't know who, but for some in this room, it's money. If we just really, if we got honest with God, for some in this room, the core of your life is money. It's, all you, it's what you think about. It's what your whole life is uh, 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 surrounding. And actually, everything else has to be connected to the money. And other things suffer, including your family, because it's all about the money. But here's the problem with the money. You can chase the money. You can be successful chasing the money. But here's the problem. You get to the end of your life and realize this wasn't what life was supposed to be. And you get to the end of your life and you regret for some in this room, what is at the hub of your life is your career, it is your job. And it's different from money. I know you get money by your career, but there are some that get their whole sense of self-worth through their job. It's my only sense of identity is through my job. Psalm 62 verse 10 says, though your riches increase, don't set your heart on them because our net worth and our self-worth are not the same thing. For others, it's family. And the truth is, you watch any movie today on any TV show, any, any channel, and if the movie has a moral to it, if it has a moral to it, the moral to the movie is put your family before everything else or put other relationships before anything else. And that's the moral of pretty much most movies today. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with work. And there's nothing wrong with family, obviously. Family is the second most important thing in our life. But the problem is, is that when we put any of those things first, the core of our life needs to be something that nothing can take from us. Why is it that Horatio Spafford in the mid-1800s saw three of his daughters drown because of a shipwreck and saw fire pretty much wipe him out financially and when all of this happens, he writes the song we still sing today, It Is Well With My Soul. How could he write a song, It Is Well With My Soul, after all of this has been wiped out? Because the core of his life was God, not anything else. If family is the core of your life, you could lose the core of your life with one car accident. What I'm saying to you is that the core of our life needs to be something that nothing can take from us. And this is why Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. If you will place God at the center of your life, at the hub of your life, he will bring order to all the other things. Look at this wagon wheel again. This is the idea that God is the hub and everything else he brings order to and meaning to and purpose to as long as he is the core of your life. Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17 says, For by Christ all things were created. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Jesus is the glue that can hold everything in our life together. The first thing that's got to be solved in our life is who, what is going to be the core of my life? What is going to be the hub of my life? And if we get it wrong, it will mess every other thing up. But if we get it right, it will bring everything together.
The second question that's got to be asked is, what will be the character of your life? What kind of character are you going to have? Proverbs 2 verse 7 says, God grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He's a shield to those who have integrity. You walk in integrity, he'll be your shield. You walk in character, he'll be your shield. We're never going to be perfect people on this globe, but we can be people of character. We can make mistakes. We can mess up. We can get angry at the wrong time. We can say things we shouldn't have said, and we can get it fixed because we are people of character. Character is doing what is right as defined by God regardless of personal cost. And we don't become people of character by accident. We become people of character on purpose. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 says this, train yourself to be godly. We build character just like we build a wall, one block upon another block, one decision upon another another decision. The third question to answer is this, how will you treat the others in your life? The others meaning your family members, your, your, your friends, your fellow Christians at church, people that are at your job or in your school, in your classroom, or people that you don't even know that you come in contact with, or people who are your enemies. How will you treat the others in your life? And Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. That word harmony means to live in balance, where all the parts are in balance with each other. Willing to forgive, be willing to be forgiven, be willing to restore. Two verses later, here's what Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, if it's possible, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What is he saying? He is saying, come on, real life is there are some people who don't like you and never will. And it's not your fault, it's theirs. There's something going on in their life. There's some issue you don't know anything about. And there are some people that you will never get in sync with. So if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Coming to a position of balance in our relationships will require more from us than them. Will I choose to be self-centered or self-giving? Will I be thoughtful or thoughtless? Will I be touchy or willing to overlook an offense? Will I be resentful or forgiving? Will I love my enemies as Jesus told me to? Here's the last one. How will you balance your time? We can't do everything. We know the four goals that we need to accomplish. We know the priorities. Put your time on your priorities. Proverbs 17, 24 says it this way, an intelligent person aims at wise actions, but a foolish person starts off in many directions. Focus is the key to a life of balance. Four goals, four questions. Listen to me, you got one life. Don't screw this up. By living for wrong things. And the greatest way to begin all of this is to come to know Jesus as your Savior. Would you do that today? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to get together with these people, our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be able to worship you with clarity and with uh, all of our love for you and to be able to open our hearts to your word. Now, Father, use these truths to help guide our path this next week with four goals and four questions and help us to make the most of our life. Show us that we were never intended to spend our life. We were intended to invest our life. And use us, 
this week. We pray. Father, I pray for those in this room that don't know Jesus Christ. And this is the day of salvation for them. I pray that they would make that decision for Jesus. I pray for those who are visiting our church today, but feel in their heart this should be their church. God, we welcome them. We want them. And we ask that you would direct them to be a part of our church today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.